It was 1974. I was at Rikers and I was about seven months pregnant. When I arrived at Rikers Island again, I was anemic, malnourished, according to my interest physical. New Jersey had been giving me iron pills, but I was anemic up to the last blood test before giving birth. The pregnancy or special diet at Rikers, in addition to regular food, was powdered milk, juice, and a hard boiled egg daily. This was my diet until I gave birth and things seemed to go normally. Meanwhile, the lawyers obtained another court order from the New York court permitting Dr. Garrett, my doctor, to continue treating me. When he came to Rikers, I was in the infirmary and they told him that the court order was no good and that he couldn't see me. I was left in the room for three days with a woman who later turned out to have active tuberculosis. It was May, they had turned the heat off, it was cold again, and women were having seizures, methadone withdrawals, and one sister who they said had pneumonia all piled blankets on their beds. The sister got worse and worse. Finally, they brought her to Immerse Hospital where she discovered she did have tuberculosis. I found this out later when she returned to Rikers, kept in isolation, and the doctors wore masks and gloves when they visit her. Also had Manila. A vaginal discharge was worsened because the Monte Four Hospital doctors assigned to Riker could not agree how it should be treated. They refused to treat the conditions at all until my culture was turned to M from Emmerhurst Hospital. By the time they managed to get the culture back, the whole inside of my thigh was chapped raw with discharge. I could barely walk. This scene offers a snapshot of my life. My life is a testament to the complex lives that many black women live. Today, I want to consider my life through the lens of Africana womanism. Africana womanism is one tool or perspective that might that can be used to help us see black women more fully. To talk about the importance of Africana womanism now, first, let's talk about back then. I was born in 1947, Queens, New York. I was known then as Joanne Deborah Bryant, later as Joanne Chesimard. I came of age during a turbulent time in black American history the 1960s. I was 17 years old when President Lyndon jo Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and I was 18 when Malcolm X was assassinated. This was a turnkey moment for the idea of black power in the nation. During the 1960s, the nation's landscape was also going un un undergoing another radical transformation, feminism. First wave feminism derived from the women's suffrage movement of 1848. Some of the prominent members were Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Steady. These women advocated for voting and property rights for middle class white women. In fact, Susan B. Anthony said herself, I will cut off this right arm of mine before I ever work or demand the ballot for the Negro and not the woman. Elizabeth Steady said it was better for a black woman to be a slave of an educated white man than of a degraded, ignorant black woman. Also, I want to acknowledge the unseen figures during this time who pushed the first wave feminist agenda, but they did not receive the acknowledgement that they deserved. These figures were Ida B. Wells, Sojourner Truth, and Frederick Douglass. First wave feminism ended in 1920, in 1920 with the 19th Amendment. This amendment granted white women the right to vote. Then there was second wave feminism. Second wave feminism was sparked by Betty Friday's text, the feminist mystique. These women advocated for sexuality, family, workplace, reproduction rights, and legal equality. Second wave feminism also was open to women of color. However, prominent scholar and activist, my sister, Angela Davis, criticized this movement because of their failure to acknowledge and bring awareness to the fact that black women during this time were suffering from compulsory sterilization programs. Through second wave feminism derived black feminism. Black feminism allowed a space for a black woman to be black and a woman. It also allowed a space where a black woman can fight against sexism, class oppression, and racism. One of the prominent texts from this movement was Mary Ann Weathers' essay, An Argument for Black Women's Liberation as a Revolutionary Force. But black feminism wasn't enough for some black women. So then, in, 18, in 1983, in Alice Walker's In the Search of Our Mother's Garden, Alice Walker coined the ideology, ideology, womanism. Ide Alice Walker describes womanism as, womanism is to feminists as purple is to lavender. 
And Alice Walker describes a womanist as a woman who loves other women sexually or non-sexually, appreciates and prefers women's culture and women's emotional and women's emotion. It's a woman who's flexible. It's a woman who is powerful. And it's a woman committed to the survival and the wholeness of entire people, women and men. But again, womanism wasn't enough for some women. So in 1987, Clear Noir Hudson Weems coined the term Africana womanism. Africana womanism focused on the Afrocentricism, it focused on Af African culture, and it also focuses on the experience and struggles and needs and desires of African women. And it's very inclusive to African women and children and men. Africana womanism has 18 tenets. Some of the tenets are self-defining, self-naming, and recognition. For today, we're going to focus on one of the tenets, which is, which is family-centered. Family-centered meaning it takes a village. That our survival as a black community depends on our unity. And now, I'm going to share with you a little from my documentary, Eyes of the Rainbow. This documentary was, was published 33 years after I was in exile in Cuba. In this documentary, I talk about my life as a political prisoner, and I also talk about someone who's dear to my heart, my grandmother. came from uh, w Wilmington, North Carolina, to see me, to see me at Yardville Prison. Uh, I was in uh, that prison. Uh, I was put in a, a maximum security unit um, in a cell with two guards in front of the cell, 24 hours a day. And so between two gun towers that could train their guns directly on the cell, um, I was told that I was in Yardville, a unit for women, even though I was the only woman. Uh, and they uh, tried to keep me there for the rest of my life. Um, my grandmother came to visit me there to tell me a dream. And she came with all of my family, and everybody was happy. And I'm like, you know, what's happening with you all? You're in this room. She had a dream. She had a dream. I was like, OK, what's up? And so my grandmother's dream was that she was dressing me, that she was in an old house that she lived in when she lived in New York still. And she was putting clothes on me. I said, is that the dream? She said, that's the dream. And I said, well, was I little or big? She said, no, you were big. I said, oh my God, the only time people dress anybody is when they're grown is when they're dead. And so she said, no, no, no. I know what you're thinking. No, no, no. What this dream means is that you are going to leave this present. I don't know when, but it's going to be much less time to and you know. Next, I will share a little of my experience when I see my family after escaping prison. As the plane swooped down over Havana, it seemed that my heart was beating out of my ribs to get out. My stomach hurt, my mouth was dry like cotton, and it seemed like a million people pulled off the plane before the tall little girl, my daughter, with great big eyes started down the ramp. I could see my mother looking frail, yet so determined. 
with my aunt behind her looking triumphant. How much we had gone through. Our fight had started on a slave ship years before we were born. Vencermos, we shall overcome. My favorite word in Spanish crossed my mind. 10 million people had stood up to the monster. 10 million people only 19 miles away. We were here together in this land, my small little family, holding each other after so long. There was no doubt about it. Our people would one day be free. The cowboys and the bandits didn't own the world. Now, I know you're wondering, how was Africana womanism important today? Well, I'll share with you a story of a woman named Pamela Turner. Pamela Turner is a 45-year-old woman from Texas, and she encountered a Texas police officer one night, and that incident ended in her death. Officials in the Houston area are investigating a deadly police shooting caught on video last night. The cell phone video posted on social media shows a Baytown, Texas police officer firing five shots after struggling to arrest a 45-year-old woman. Nikki Batiste is covering this still unfolding story and joins us with the table. The video we've seen so far is very disturbing. It's extremely disturbing, Gail. Police say the 11-year veteran was apparently doing a routine patrol outside of an apartment complex when he came across a woman who he knew had outstanding warrants. We must warn you, the video you are about to see can be disturbing to some viewers. This cell phone video begins as the officer confronts the woman. In conclusion, I will leave you with this. It's not enough to advocate for a specific gender or person, but the survival of the black community as a whole depends on not only the black woman, but the black man and the black child. Because in society, as you know, we're often not seen, whether we be a child, a woman, or a man. Thank you. My name is Kishanta Drake. I would like to say I embodied Asada Shakur during this presentation. I would like to give acknowledge to the Ronald E. McNair program. I also would like to give acknowledgement to the Michigan State News Program. Thank you for having me.